Today's verse is Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 to 38. Again, that's Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 to 38. And it says, While they were going out, and who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When they saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like little sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That's the word of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Thank you, Josiah. It's good to see everybody here today. So if you were here last week, you know why. Uh, if you were not here last week, you'll just have to guess or ask somebody else. No, Edison talked. Edison. That's the other one I had to announce, is Edison is here. I'm really excited about him being here. He is our new Spanish minister, and so that's great. I hope you get a chance to meet him today and make him feel welcome. Uh, one other thing just to let you know about, the light rail is supposed to go right down Main Street to Gilbert. So here in our building on Tuesday, they're having a meeting, which is for all the community. And even though you guys don't live around here, if you're interested in the light rail, come to the meeting, it's at six o'clock. So Ralph talked last week about not wearing ties. I came up with this. So does that sound better? You know, reaching millennials and that kind of thing. And I said, I barely made it out of the house. And uh, Nancy said, I feel like I'm sitting with a stranger. So <laughs> I offered to sit somewhere else, but you know, she said, no, that's okay. I have to be kind to strangers. So, she's always good that way. All right, so we want to talk about compassion today and a little bit about what that means for us and, and how that is. And I just want to tell you, in looking at compassion, I thought, well, I'll do pretty good with this one. Not at all. Uh, sometimes you look at this and you think you got it all down, and then you start looking further and you realize that it takes a whole lot to have compassion and so let me share some thoughts with you. Uh, the passage that Josiah has already read to us comes out of Matthew 9. And, and obviously this is a place where there's great compassion because they're bringing all of these people who are distressed, who have difficulties, they're, they're demon of, oppressed, they're, and he's got a, a mute demon. I mean, that's even worse. Uh, the only worse one is a deaf and mute demon. I don't know why that's worse, but that, just some of those things, it seems like it's so difficult to deal with. And there are hard things in life that are very difficult to deal with. And the crowds are amazed, but what they're amazed at is, one, that Jesus is able to do this miracle, but I think they're really amazed at the compassion of God. That somebody would see this guy, somebody would take care of this guy, somebody would even want to do that. I mean, if there's ever a case where, okay, send this guy somewhere else, it ought to be this one. You know, a guy who's really evil, really possessed by Satan and has a demon. And, you know, we would think that, you know, that's one of the guys to cast out. But the crowd marvels and says, we've never seen anything like this. And I think it's incredible. People understand how impossible life is but they also love to see how compassionate God can be. Of course, then you have the other side, you have the Pharisees. And their reaction to this whole thing is, well, he casts out demon by the prince of demons. In other words, we think he might be possessed himself. He's in league with the devil, and he is here to lead you astray. He's here to do all kinds of terrible things to you. And he's nothing but deceptive, just like Satan would be. How can two different groups look at the same situation and have such complete different reactions? And the answer is compassion. 
You see, one group has compassion and sees this and is, a, is so impressed at the compassion of God. In fact, that's who they give credit to. They give glory to God because God, obviously, you know, we can't fix this. Obviously, God has had compassion on this guy. And so what a great thing for God to be able to do that. But the Pharisees don't see that at all. They see that this is just more of a doctrinal test and some theological way of approaching things. They says, well, obviously he has a demon. We can't trust him. They don't see the guy. And so they feel no compassion whatsoever. It's, it's you know, not about anything to do with the man. It's about you can't do that. And so when you begin to look at the two different approaches, it makes me wonder, you know, if Jesus had compassion on a guy and converted him, would he be different than the Pharisees with their approach with a new convert? Do you think they would look the same? Do you think they would act the same? You know, I think they might be completely different in the way that they approach life. The Pharisees have no mercy, no sympathy. It's not even personal. It's not even about that. It's just a theological problem. That's all it is. I think if we cannot look at people with compassion, we're not going to really understand God. We're not going to understand what he's like. We're not going to understand what he's going through because compassion is just part of what it takes. Just being able to see and get along with other people and it's one of those things that I think is very, very important. Compassion is easy for the weak and the helpless. The other thing he links this to is harvest. He has compassion for the crowd because they are distressed, they're helpless, they have no direction, they don't really understand what they're supposed to do, and they don't really know how to get close to God. And so he has compassion on them, he sees them that way, and he says, this is about harvest. What does he mean this is about harvest? I think he ties compassion to harvest. He says, you know, harvest is really about having compassion on a world that's lost. That doesn't understand God. And that's what our response is to be. Is harvest is more about compassion than it is theology. Because until you have compassion on those people... I'm not sure our theology is going to really help. It's like the love passage that, that we looked at this morning in class. I mean, if you don't have love, you're just kind of the clanging gong and the you know noisy symbol, and it's just so much words in the air. If you don't really have love, if you don't have compassion for those people, it's just so much theology. And did you ever really make a convert harvest? is about compassion. And I think that's huge when we start looking at Jesus and what he does because it makes a difference for us. Conversion is not just some pharisaical exercise in getting the right doctrine and having people agree with us. It's about taking care of somebody when they don't feel good. About being lost and amazed and realizing God is what brings us that kind of comfort. Compassion is about believing in something good. And I think we all want and need compassion. You find it sometimes in some of the most unexpected places. But it is what communicates better than anything else. If you ever want to speak about God, it almost has to be with this kind of compassion, not just something that we can say, but that's devoid of any personality or any kind of love. Of course, I think there's the other side to it as well. You know, yes, you're compassionate for the child, and we all love our children. Even, it's easier when they get hurt, right, than when they're rebellious. Sometimes it's harder to have compassion at that point. Um, but we love our children whether they do good or whether they do bad. It's easier to love them when they're doing good, but we need compassion sometimes when they're angry and sometimes when they're upset. But we don't act like them. Because after all, we show compassion when they're angry and upset and frustrated and they're not acting right. And, you know, they whine and pout and scream and throw a tantrum. And it doesn't mean we give them what they want. But they do get one thing. 
They get our compassion. I'm sorry you're upset. I'm sorry you're mad. No, you still don't get it. <laughs> so there can be compassion without just giving in and saying, all right, it's fine, it's okay. It's, it's not just fine, it's not just okay. And there are times when it's hard to show compassion because you have to say no. And I think God is like that. It's not just a matter of compromise. That's not compassion. A definition of compassion, it's a sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others. Victims should be treated with compassion, but that's just Webster. What about when they cause it themselves? Then it's a little harder to have compassion, isn't it? Is that still compassion when they caused it themselves and put themselves in the situation? Yeah, I know that's what we have with kids, right? Sometimes they put themselves in the situation. There's a couple more passages I want to share with you from Matthew 15 and verse 29. It says, Jesus went on from there and he walked by the Sea of Galilee and he went up on a mountain and he sat down there. And a great crowd came to him, bringing to him with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And when they put them at his feet, he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. And Jesus called his disciples to him, and he said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And his disciples looked, said to him, Where are we going to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd. They see it as more a logistical problem of bread. It's not a compassion problem. Well, I know they've been here three days. They should have brought more lunch. It's their fault. It's not our fault. There's nothing we can do about it. And that seems to be their approach to it. But Jesus has a whole different approach to it. You see, first of all, they brought people so that he could have compassion on them by healing and they see God that's the way you show God because they see God in the fact that he's able to heal all of these people and able to to have the lame that are walking the blind that are seeing what an incredible thing and then he says I have compassion but I want you to notice the reason that he has compassion because sometimes compassion is not just their poor pitiful people I have compassion because they have been with me for three days and now they don't have anything to eat. I have compassion because of their dedication. So it's not about us just trying to look pitiful before God. That's not always the reason. Sometimes the compassion of God comes more because of a person's dedication. They've sat for three days listening to Jesus and lunch ran out long time ago. And they only find so much. Certainly he's able to feed them if that's the criteria. But as you look at it all, it's not, not their idea. Their idea is, well, we better send them away. He says, no. Jesus is concerned that they won't even make it home. That's a lot of dedication. And he says, I have compassion on something like that. Isn't it their fault? They stayed. He says, no, I have compassion when someone is dedicated like that to me. And so I think that's amazing to be able to see that when you have compassion on somebody. Not sure who has the compassion here. I think big sister can't quite reach the pedals, so she's not able to go. So little sister, I assume those are both sisters by the hats. No boy's going to wear a hat like that. So... Little sister has to say, I'll push. And maybe big sister has more compassion on little sister because, wow, you pushed. But sometimes you just do because they can't quite make it themselves. And so you do it. And I think God's kind of like that. It's not just because people are distressed. It's why they're distressed. I think God had compassion when the early Christians were tortured and put in prison but does it mean God fixes it? And sometimes the answer is no. But he does feel compassion. My question is, does that help you? 
For a lot of people, it's no, I don't believe in a God who's not going to fix it for me. Yeah. What kind of household did you grow up in? Certainly wasn't like mine. Compassion is such a valuable thing. He has compassion for those who would serve him, and yet he does not fix everything in their life. And sometimes we can't fix it. And they hurt. And the only thing we can do is have compassion on them. Is that valuable to you? It might be a test of whether you're a compassionate person or not. And the last one today, I think, is one of those that we can tell a lot about. Luke 23 is the time when Jesus goes to the cross. And so Luke records it this way in verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led us away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they, were cruci they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and one on the left... And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, and the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up, offering him sour wine, saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's pretty hard to have compassion when people are insulting you, isn't it? Especially when you're at your point of pain, when you're at the worst, and they have cried for this they have said crucify him crucify him he doesn't deserve to live we don't want him here that's pretty hard to have compassion and they're constantly doing this they're at the place where he is crucified he is dying and they're still doing this to him on top of that all the soldiers are too on top of that it's it's people are, are questioning whether he's able to save anyone you know, if you're really the Messiah, then come down from the cross. Save yourself. If you can't save yourself, how are you going to save us? And they just kind of have that arrogance about them. Makes you mad, wouldn't it? I mean, why would you say, oh, I have compassion on them? And then they put this sign over it like the king of the Jews as if. But it's really true, isn't it? Wouldn't you take it to say, ha. Huh, they're laughing, thinking the sign is mocking me, but you don't understand. In fact, that's what he says. He says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But I want to ask you, does it seem like they don't know what they're doing? Seems pretty much like they do, don't they? I mean, they didn't accidentally say, oh, we happen to have a board with nails and it's crossed and we just happen to nail you on it. It was an accident. This is no accident. He says they don't know what they're doing, but it seems pretty intentional to me. You know, they worked up all this crowd. They're screaming, you know, crucify, crucify, crucify. That seems very intentional. But what they don't know is that this is the Son of God. And what they don't know is how much compassion he has. And so his words are, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If they really knew I was their Messiah, I was their king, they would not crucify me. 
and the thief on one side says the same thing. You know, well, if you're the son of God, then why don't you save all of us? Save yourself and us. You know, I think he's making fun of him. I think he's mocking him just like everybody else. And it's kind of easy to fall into that. But then you've got the thief on the other side. He says, don't you know? Don't you know who this is? Don't you fear God? Obviously he doesn't. Nobody there fears God. They don't fear anybody. But that's what he's doing with him, isn't it? They're mocking there's no belief there. And yet when he comes, he says, don't you fear God. It's the same condemnation. We're rightly condemned, but he's not. We're guilty. He's innocent. We're getting what we deserve. That's a confession of sin. Yes, you should crucify me because I actually did it. That would hold up in court, wouldn't it? I actually did it. We're getting punished for what we deserve. It's not compassion, I don't think, but respect for Jesus because he does believe. And in the face of a crowd that is shouting at Jesus of unbelief, there is one voice that says, I believe he's the Son of God. I believe Jesus will come in his kingdom. I believe he's the Messiah. I believe he's the new king. And so his statement is simply, remember me when you come in your kingdom. It's a faith confession of Jesus as Messiah. And Jesus' response is a response of compassion. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Compassion for a thief? Yeah. Why? Because that thief is repentant. That thief is respectful. And that thief believes. And that allows Jesus to have compassion like no other. I mean, for all of the ones who are screaming, he does say, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, but God does not. He cannot. I mean, he will 50 days later when they hear that, you know, by repentance and confession, they are able to be forgiven of their sins. Then, yes, they can be. But at this point, Jesus is showing his own compassion. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But he does not offer to take them to paradise. But to a thief. I mean, a thief who is confessed and guilty because of his repentance, because of his respect, because... Jesus has compassion. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And if Jesus has compassion for a thief, I think he can have compassion for you. There's nothing you've done that is so dreadful that he can't. It does make it much easier and him move much quicker with your repentance, with your confession, with your belief. When Jesus has compassion on us, it is not because we're innocent. It is not because we're cute. It is not because we're lovable. It is not because we're even likable. Sometimes we're the one doing the screaming. But the compassion is more about Jesus than it is about us. You see, we have compassion on situations and people that we think deserve compassion. And that's what gets to me the most. Jesus has compassion regardless. I don't think we do that very well. Jesus has compassion regardless of what the people have done. When we are not lovable, not cute, not likable, Jesus has compassion on us. Because his compassion is about him and about how he loves.
And he is able to be compassionate to the ugly, to the dirty, to the sinful, to the terrible, to the awful, to the horrible, to us. He has compassion for you this morning. And maybe you think this morning you deserve a cross. But I want you to know that Jesus has that kind of compassion that he can take away your sins. He can make you completely clean because he's the one who cares like that. The only question is, can you respond to compassion like that? Shall we stand and sing?